Well, welcome to the continuing of the series, The Prison I've Built. And today the message is called Escaping the Trap. But I'm glad that, you know, Pastor Terry and Sherry came up and they talked about Israel and all that's going on right now over there. It's heavy on my heart. And I'm going to be speaking about attacks and traps but there are people facing physical war right now. And so I just, I just want to pray for them again and for the service today. And um, actually, I want to share also, before I pray, a word I got for service. When we were worshiping, I, I was seeing doors were being opened, and they were like sci-fi doors. They were going like shh you know, like just opening. And I feel like the, the Lord is opening doors in your heart of things that you have compartmentalized for years, where you have compartmentalized your grief and your pain and your abuse. And the Lord is going to open those doors and clean them out and bring you freedom today, today in Jesus' name. So would you stand and just pray with me? Father, we thank you for your graciousness. We worship you, God. You are good. We know that you see what's going on on the other side of the world in Israel, and we stand for their freedom. We ask for your protection over them, and we ask for peace, Lord. And God, I just pray for everyone here today. I pray, Lord, that this message glorifies you. God, I pray again that my words would be few, that it would not be my heart being portrayed, but yours, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for the shaking loose that you're going to do today. And I pray your love to just sweep through each heart and fill them and fill them and fill them. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, when I was getting ready to do this message, I guess just thinking about it and escaping the trap, and I, I kept thinking about it as this whole series actually getting stuck in forgiveness or an unforgiveness and offense, and I just felt like this message is kind of like an emergency preparedness training. Have any of you been to one of those at work? <laughs> Where you do like the fire drills or the, I don't know what, like in the South we had tornado warning things and stuff like that. But I just feel like in the spirit, we need to have our escape plan ready and we need to be, be ready and on guard. And so um, there was a actual, it was like an active shooter training in, in Hermiston recently, but they don't call it that now. They call it a hostile event training or something like that. And there's all kinds of different hostile events that happen. So what they do is they look at different scenarios and then they go over it to try to learn and to teach how you can do things better, how you can be better prepared and how you can escape or you know, usually you fight or flight, but how you can escape or, or fight or do what you need to do when the attack comes. And there was one, um, one story Chad actually shared it with me. He's the one that went to the training. I didn't. But the, the story is about a fire that happened a long time ago. And it was in a big room. And everyone in there was, was about to be trapped and felt trapped by this fire that was beginning to engulf everything. And so one group ran towards the front entrance. They ran towards the doors to get out. And they were so, uh, they were so panicked and they were pressing so hard that they were stuck in the door frame. They got stuck on the way out. So many people kept continually trying to press through that they got stuck and they never made it out. And then there was another group of people who decided to go deeper into the building and hide from the fire. And that didn't work well for them either. And so um, just learning from those scenarios, I'm going to use it as an illustration, actually, for today's message. 
Because if we are not armed with the right tools or the right knowledge, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get out. We're not gonna have a good escape plan and our, our exit strategy will fail. But when you came back to that room, when they were studying the event later, and they looked at the room, a picture of the room pre-fire, pre the destruction, one whole wall of the room was glass windows. The room had pool tables in it with billiard balls and, and pool cue sticks and I don't know, whatever hard objects there were. But if they had just broken through the windows, they could have all gotten out to safety. So for this illustration, when we think about the people stuck in the door frame, just stuck there, that would represent those who are stuck in unforgiveness. They've let bitterness grow and take root. They obviously wanted to be free, but they were keeping themselves bound by the unforgiveness and offense that was in their heart. And then the group that went further into the building, they kind of represent people who get offended or they're just trying to do it in their own strength and say, it didn't really happen. I'm going to hide from it and maybe it'll go away. So if I say it didn't happen, then I don't need to worry about unforgiveness or forgiving or any of that. It just, maybe it'll just go away. And they're hoping that it won't find them and they won't have to face it. The fire is the attack of the enemy. And then the, the items in the room that I was talking about, they represent our, our weapons, our warfare. You take the pool billiard and throw it to the window. That's our prayer or the pool sticks, the word of God. The things that we've learned before, these are the tools of, uh, the weapons of our warfare when we act in humility and we don't avenge ourselves. And the windows, they represent freedom. They represent forgiveness and the way out. And so that brings me to point number one. In the case of emergency, break the glass. You see, the windows in the building were there the whole time. In fact, the, blueprint, the blueprints of the building, the whole design had those windows there. Before any attack happened and before uh, the fire happened, they were already there. And we're going to come back to that. Don't be misled. Attacks will come. Sometime in our lives, we're going to offend somebody. Whether we want to or not, we will offend somebody and we will get offended. But what matters is what we do with the offense. Luke 17, 1 says, Then he, Jesus, said to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they come. So offenses are going to come. Offense is the trap. And unforgiveness is the trap. It's going to happen. And when we face an offense, and when we come up to a, a trap, anytime we face an offense, two things are going to happen. It's going to change you either way. You're either going to get stronger, or you're going to get bitter. Going through an offense, you're either going to get better or you're going to get bitter. We need to ask ourselves, which one are we going to be? The trap is designed by the enemy to trick you, to lure you in, to make you stumble and fall. It's always done in secrecy. It's always hidden. You know, because as believers, we're not going to just see, ooh, a trap, and try to get trapped. We're not going to purposefully walk into a trap. The enemy is trying to deceive us. He is the deceiver. We're not going to willingly step into his traps, but he is trying to make us fall down because he wants to laugh at us. Have you ever watched like ice skating with someone who just can't wait for them to fall down? No? Just, no? Me neither. 
I, no. Or how about a hockey game? Do you go to a hockey game hoping that they'll get into a fight? Come on, somebody. Yes, okay. A little excitement in the game. Well, that's just kind of a fun little way, but this is serious because the enemy watches us that way. He watches us because he wants us to not only fall down so he can laugh at us, but he wants to kick us and hit us and keep us down so we stay bound. And his hope is that we never get back up. He doesn't want us to be free. First Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's a lot of heavy stuff about traps. So right now I want to share a little encouragement for us from Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Hallelujah. This I pray over Israel too. And this psalm is speaking about safety of abiding in the Lord. Safety from the snare of the fowler. That's a weird word, but a fowler just means someone who used to set traps or sets traps to catch birds. They want to catch birds. So the devil is the fowler. And what are we? We're the birds. We're meant to be free and flying and, and staying under the feathers of the Almighty God. But the devil is being compared to someone who sets traps for birds. He's got his nets or he's got his sticks. And here's the thing about traps. You don't always use the same trap for every kind of bird or for every kind of animal. A good trapper knows the habits and tendencies of its prey. And that is how the enemy watches us, to set our traps. So we need to be aware of the truth of the Lord so we don't fall in his traps. So what are we supposed to do? How do we not get caught in a snare? Or how do we escape the trap? We've been learning the last several weeks all the messages that we've been having about unforgiveness. And we've learned what? You can throw out your scoreboard, right? Quit keeping track. Quit tallying up. Well, they did that to me, so I'm going to do that. And we can throw all that out. We learn how to handle unfair treatment and to forgive people, forgive our father figures and mentors and those, those in authority over us. But to escape the trap, we must forgive. Unforgiveness just creates more links in the chains of your prison. When we talk about unforgiveness, it's what keeps us trapped we, when we harbor unforgiveness, it's our prison. It's not our offender's prison. We're bound by the chains that we have put around our own feet. Don't get me wrong. Okay, I'm not saying that we caused the offense. And I'm not saying that a true offense doesn't cause great pain. There is pain and offense. I'm not denying that the hurt exists. Like the ones who hid from the fire, pretending it wasn't there. I'm not denying the hurt. I'm denouncing the hindrance of unforgiveness that holds me back from being free of the offense. How do we know? 
How do we know, though, if we have an offense? Are you preoccupied with something? When you go to bed, does it keep you awake at night? Does it make your blood pressure rise every time you think about it? Do you lay in bed at night and think of all the things that you could have or would have, shed, would have said or should have said? Or next time I'll say this and really stick it to them? Are you plotting your revenge? These are all signs and symptoms of holding an offense. The snare is caused to make you fall. The snare wants to make you fall, but the attack is twofold. The first part of the plan is to get you to fall, to stumble. But the second part is hoping then that you'll sin. To sin by not forgiving you know what our problem is that we categorize sins. We have our really big sins, and then we have the other ones that we like to just call weaknesses. Those ones that we call weaknesses, we don't really deal with them. Sin is sin. If we are if we are downplaying the sin to call it a weakness, we know we're just kind of setting aside and we won't deal with it. And we think we're doing pretty well if we just focus on the big sins. But sin is sin. Mark eleven twenty five 25 and 26 says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, Neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. We're going to do a little review. I know that Austin, in his message a couple weeks ago, um, I've stopped counting. He touched on this parable a little bit, but I I want to read it with you and and dig into it a little bit more. This is a parable um, Jesus told his disciples about the unforgiving servant. And it's found in Matthew 18, 21 through 35. It does say Mark up there, but it's actually Matthew. I just want to make sure you're all on your toes. So Matthew, we're going to be in Matthew 18. And to um, just kind of preface this, at the beginning of it, the, the section, Peter has asked Jesus, how many times do I need to forgive my brother when he sins against me? And he's like, do I need to forgive him seven times? In the Old Testament law, they, it says that you only have to forgive your brother three times. So according to the law, it was only three times. You can imagine Peter then thinking, wow, I'm going to like more than double that. Isn't Jesus going to be impressed with me? Like, I'm going to go up to seven times. But no, Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven And that doesn't mean we're supposed to do the math, and I'm glad because I hate math. But it just means that we are to be limitless in how we forgive. To forgive perfectly like Jesus does, and that's hard. Point number two is to stop counting. So this is the parable in Matthew 18, 23 through 35. And it says... There once was a king who had servants who had borrowed money from the royal treasury. The king decided to settle accounts with each of them. As he began the process, it came to his attention that one of his servants owed him one billion dollars. So he summoned the servant before him and said to him, pay me what you owe me. But when his servant was unable to repay his debt, the king ordered that he be sold as a slave along with his wife and children and every possession that he owed as repayment toward that debt. The servant threw himself face down at his master's feet and begged for mercy. Please be patient with me. Just give me more time and I will repay you all that I owe. Upon hearing his pleas, the king 
had compassion on his servant, and he released him and forgave his entire debt. No sooner had the servant left when he met one of his fellow servants who owed him $20,000. He seized him by the throat and began to choke him, saying, you would better pay me right now everything you owe me. His fellow servant threw himself face down at his feet and begged, please be patient with me. If you'll just give me more time, I will repay you all that is owed. But the one who had his debt forgiven stubbornly refused to forgive what was owed him. He had his fellow servant thrown into prison and demanded he remain there until he repaid the debt in full. When his associates saw what was going on, they were outraged and they went to the king and told him the whole story. The king said to him, you scoundrel, is this the way you respond to my mercy? Because you begged me, I forgave you the massive debt that you owed me. Why didn't you show the same mercy to your fellow servant that I showed to you? In a fury of anger, the king turned him over to the prison guards to be tortured until all his debt was repaid. In this same way, my heavenly father will deal with any of you if you do not release forgiveness from your heart towards your fellow believer. This is important truth of God's word for us to know and understand in our hearts. How do we forgive? How do we let go of that offense? The first thing, maybe the most important thing to remember is that forgiving is not just an option or it's a choice, but it's a commandment. And the second thing is that we were not designed. God didn't make our bodies to hold in unforgiveness. In fact, there's medical research that even shows the effects that forgiveness has on our physical bodies. I'm not going to get into that, but there's verifiable research that shows health benefits by forgiving. We weren't made to hold in and harbor unforgiveness. And if we're holding back forgiveness because we're waiting for our offender to come to us, acknowledge they're wrong, and say they're sorry, then we aren't really seeking forgiveness. We're seeking our revenge. We're seeking our own avenging. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. We heard that last week from Pastor Terry in the message of how to handle unfair treatment. But when we hold back our forgiveness because we want them to come to us and say, I'm sorry, essentially we're seeking our own justice. And what we're saying is, what we're saying to the offender in that case is then, I condemn you to unforgiveness until you admit it and I say that you're worthy of being forgiven. When we act like our own judge and jury, and we hold people in, in unforgiveness, how are we making room for God to avenge us? But when we can release people to forgiveness, we can be free. We just release it to the Lord and trust him to avenge us. But I think, and maybe just because of my own personal experiences that I've learned the hard way, one of the reasons why we have such a hard time releasing offenses to the Lord is that we don't trust his goodness. We don't trust his goodness because what's he going to do? How is he going to make him pay? We want to know if it's going to be up to our standards. We, we want to know what he's going to do. But you know what? God's plans to avenge might include them being saved. Are we ready for that? He wants to save our offenders. But when we're hurt, do we tend to be a little bit more like the sons of thunder, James and John? When we hold hurt in, are we a little bit more like James and John, who in God's word tells us, Jesus had to rebuke them because they said, Jesus, can we call down fire and smite them? Because they were offended and rejected, rejected him. 
Is that kind of how we get, or you know, just me sometimes? Hmm. So when we don't forgive, we stay stuck. We need to use the tools. When we practice forgiveness in our lives daily, when we're faithful to forgive little offenses that don't hurt as much, we're building our tools. We need to strengthen our prayer life in order to be able to tackle those bigger offenses when they come, when the pain is a little deeper. I've heard it said this way before. A sinning man stops praying, but a praying man stops sinning. We need to strengthen our prayer lives. When you don't forgive, you stay stuck. You're stuck in the past, and you're continually just mulling it over. You're regurgitating and chewing on it and chewing on it and just reliving it. And every time you bring that back up, the acid of that hurt is re-injuring yourself. The hurt is being relived, and you're feeling re-injured every time. Because you're ruminating on the offense. And since I am a dairy farmer's daughter, it made me think of a cow. Do, does anybody here know that a cow chews their cud? Raise your hand if you know what that means. Okay. Well, so this is what cows do. They take already consumed food and they regurgitate it and they chew it up again. And so that's what we do when we ruminate on old hurts. We puke them back up and we chew on them. And the acid of that old hurts re-injures us and causes the roots of bitterness to grow deeper. So I really want to give you a visual. I want you to remember this idea of ruminating and of chewing on the acid of your old hurts and offenses. So I have a video to show you. <laughs> that is Devin the cow. Apparently that's his name and he's from some animal sanctuary. But I want that to be a visual that comes back into your mind as you're going through life and you think about a cow for some odd reason. Maybe that's God saying, hey, you might be ruminating on something you shouldn't be right now. When you think of this funny video and that cow's face in your face, it might be God telling you, stop chewing on that. Cows actually are supposed to do that. It's not something that we're trying to get them to stop doing. It's actually healthy for cows to chew on their cud. In fact, if they're not doing that, it would be considered a cause of concern. They, they tend to do that. Um, I had to look it up, but apparently cows chew their cud 484 to 670 sometimes a day. But you see, cows have four stomachs technically one stomach with four compartments. And to do that is very healthy for them. They need that. They need that acid and enzymes or whatever to be able to process food the right way. But we're not cows. And we don't have four stomachs. We're not built to carry unforgiveness. We can't stomach it, literally. There is a biblical aspect of ruminating, though, which is what these cows are doing. They're using the right way of ruminating, um, just as an illustration. But the biblical definition for ruminating is a practice that helps us to read or listen to God's word reflectively and prayerfully. It's a practice that helps us to take in the life-giving nutrients from Scripture. If we replace regurgitating and ruminating with meditating on God's word, it will bring health to our gut. 
It will restore our spirit. So that's my second point. Chew on this. Chew on the word of God. Think of Devin the cow. Let's chew on, meditate, and eat the word of the Lord so that maybe we can be prepared when the attack comes. Maybe we'll be so prepared that we can even help others to safety and lead them out of the trap. And let's not forget the great debt that Jesus paid for you and me. He forgave us, even though we never deserved it. We have the ability in our hearts because of Jesus Christ to forgive. Just like the illustration of the fire and the windows that were part of the design of the building, Jesus Christ is the design for our salvation and our freedom. It was already built in from the beginning of time. No matter what your sins were, he already knew them and he already forgave them by his work on the cross. He knew everything we were going to do before we were even born. He still forgives you. He still loves you. It's not worth it to be bound and caught up in our offenses, being locked up in our offense, growing bitter. Remember at the beginning we said that you'll either grow bitter or stronger when you go through an offense. So I want to read again to you 1 Peter 5, 8, and then add 9 and 10 to it. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to, to devour. But listen to what it says next. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We know we will get stronger if we persevere. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Let's no longer ruminate on our offenses, but meditate on God's word together. It's time to pull out the roots of bitterness and to break the chains of offense. I'd like to ask you to stand with me. Maybe there's something that's been on your mind these last several weeks in this message series. Maybe something came to mind today that you thought you were done with. Or maybe you haven't even addressed yet. But whatever it is, today's the day for freedom. If you'll just think about it, if you have something or just for the person around you even, let's all just lift our hands to the Lord as a symbol of release. And just pray. Father, forgive me for holding on to this offense. I'm ready now. I'm ready now to release it to you, God. I trust you, my Father, to avenge. I trust in your goodness, Jesus. And I want to be free. Father God, I pray that you bless each one as they have lifted up that which has caused them to be stuck. Pour your love out on them, Lord. Let it rain, let it rain. Let it rain down on them. That they could not escape your goodness. They cannot escape your love. And every place where the offense, the hurt, and the bitterness was, Lord, replace it with the joy of the Lord. the joy of the Lord come right now in Jesus' name. The God of all peace, flood your minds and your spirits. We thank you, Father, that you've taken it and we trust you with it. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I just want to remind you also that we have the altars up here. Anytime, if you want to bring something to the Lord for praise or for to release during the song or any time. But right now I just want to ask, is there somebody here? Maybe you've heard of Jesus, but you've never taken that step to say, be my God. You don't know him. You don't have a relationship with him. If you're ready today to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior, to trust him, to ask him to replace all those things, if you're ready to do that for the first time today, would you be so brave to raise your hand? Does anyone want to begin a new life in Jesus today? Or maybe you just really want to rededicate your life to the Lord today. Today is the day of your freedom. Anybody? Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Let's just pray this prayer together. Father, Forgive me for doing things my own way. I ask you, Lord, to take the offense, to take my sin, and replace it with your love and your goodness. Dwell in my heart from this day forward. I proclaim that I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. I just pray the Lord's blessing on all of you this week. I just pray for peace here and in Israel. But take advantage of the altars up here and enjoy and walk in your freedom today.